Howdy folks, welcome back to another CS128 Honors Lecture. In today's video, we're going to be talking more about borrowing, slices, and program memory. Um, this is one of my favorite lectures to give because it gives a brief look ahead into some future CS classes you'll take here in Illinois. So a little bit about data structures, uh, a little bit about computer architecture, and uh, maybe even a quick look ahead at operating systems. So um, the concepts in this lecture will come up heavily in those classes. Uh, you just need a basic understanding to understand why we need borrowing and slices in Rust. Okay, let's get into it. So we'll start off by answering a bunch of your questions. Thank you for those. Um, in Prairie there's an additional question that you can just type in any feedback, any questions you have, and we periodically go through those and answer them. So the first part of this video is dedicated to answering those questions. Then I'm going to do a quick review of ownership and borrowing, um, then start talking about program memory and how your computer interacts with your code and how that interacts with RAM and all of the other sort of low-level details of your computer. And then at the end, um, this is all to set up uh, strings and uh, vector slices, and so how we sort of access subcomponents of strings, why we need to borrow certain things, um, what borrowing actually does under the hood. So um, all of this is a sort of motivation to why we need borrowing. Okay, let's get into it. A um, couple of reminders. So homework five is releasing tonight. It's due on the 21st. Uh, homework four is due on uh, Thursday. MP0 is due tomorrow. So please be sure to come to office hours if you have not uh, started, if you need help, whatever the case is. Uh, if you need help, please come to office hours. We're happy to help you. Uh, MP1 released yesterday. Uh, we'll be releasing a hints video uh, along with this lecture. So uh, if you, before you get started on MP1, please watch the hints video. Um, we will also be releasing an anonymous feedback survey in the next few days. Uh, this is a chance for you to sort of give your feedback, um, tell us what you want to see in the course, uh, tell us what you think we can improve on, tell us if, if you want us to cover something more in detail, whatever the case is. Uh, so please let us know what you're thinking. Uh, if we can get 50 responses, or 40 responses rather, by Sunday, we'll give 2% extra credit to everyone. If we get 60 responses, we'll give everyone 4% extra credit. So on your questions. So uh, there were a couple comments about unclear specifications in assignments. Um, we hear you, so we are working through these. We're trying to make all of our explanations clear, all of our comments clear. So when you feel that there's something that is unclear, please let us know in Discord. Uh, please let us know in Prairie Learn. Um, we're actively trying to make test cases clear, make explanations clear. So. Um, we only know about these things when you tell us, uh, so please keep commenting about how we can make explanations or details uh, a little bit more clear. And if you're not getting uh, responses you know, immediately, if there's no office hours at the current time you're working, uh, just shoot a comment in Discord. Uh, DM either Earl or myself, uh, put it in the general forum. Um, there are a lot of course staff and a lot of other students who are facing similar problems, and um, I'm sure that everyone could benefit from that. Okay. So um, please keep telling us, please just drop a DM to core staff. Please drop a message in the Discord if you have any questions uh, while we clear things up. Um, but please keep telling us about any sort of miswordings. Okay. So uh, I know the course is fast paced, so I understand the difficulty of the homework, but I would all, would, it would also be great to give us some simpler problems to get us used to the semantics of Rust. So this is something we are also actively trying to do. Uh, we have the extra practice section in Prairie Learn full of practice pr uh, Rust problems. Um, this is a fast paced course. We try to get everything, or we try to get you the basics of Rust in two lectures a week in just eight weeks. Um, so that you can sort of work on final projects for the last half of the semester. Uh, this does make the course fast paced. And so we're trying to give you guys more practice. That's why we introduced the discussion section. Um, so please come to that. We can give you more practice problems there. Uh, we can talk through sort of uh, concepts that we sort of skipped over in lecture. Um, all of that, please come to discussion. We can help you out. We can give you more practice problems. We're working on adding more practice problems to Prey Learn. So stay tuned for those. 
Um, but please just interact with the core staff. They're very, very smart people. And so um, we are more than happy to help you out. Um, yeah, so going forward, we'll try to get out some extra practice problems, uh, especially once we start introducing parallelism. Uh, that is a tougher concept, and we do have more sort of slower paced practice for that. Um, but again, please come to office hours, please come to discussion. Uh, if, if we have, if you have more questions beyond what the extra practice problems cover. Okay. Um, and if office hours or the discussion times don't work for you, please reach out to us. We can move around these times and sort of line things up with everyone else's schedule. So um, if certain times don't work, please reach out and we're happy to help. Okay. So is there an easier way to convert uh, ampersand str, so string slices, to string instead of just dot to string? Or is uh, that something we always need to do when returning strings? So yes, to convert from ampersand str to a string, you need to use dot string. There are a couple other conversion methods you can use, but they effectively do the same thing. So you can use the dot to string function, you can use dot to owned. Um, so now that you know ownership, uh, when you're converting an ampersand str, you know the ampersand is a borrow. We'll talk more about why we need the ampersand str here today, but um, you can use dot to owned to convert it to an owned uh, struct, to an owned value. So string is an owned value. It is its own custom type. There's no borrows on it. So now that you know ownership, to owned does the same thing as to string, converts the reference to an owned value. Um, you can also use the string constructor, string from hello. Um, that's another way to do it. There are more ways. Uh, these involve traits. That is something we'll cover in the special topics lectures uh, after spring break. But um, there are different ways to convert uh, ampersand str to a string based on these conversion traits, uh, these conversion interfaces. Um, but again, there are many more ways, but they're all just sort of different flavors of the above versions. They all accomplish the same thing. They create a new string struct from a string reference. Okay. So uh, we get a lot of questions about whether we're going to be going through solutions. So we have a solution video for MP0 recorded. We'll be getting that out um, once the 70% credit deadline has expired. Uh, if you want to see solutions, ahead of time, please come into discussion. We'd be more than happy to sort of walk you through how we as core staff approach the problem. Um, but we want to wait for the 70% credit deadline to expire to be fair to all other students who sort of completed the, um, the assignments before each deadline. Um, but once the deadlines expire, we will be sort of releasing these extra credit or these uh, solution blockers. Yep, the language makes me furious. Uh, I definitely had that when I started learning Rust. It has a steep learning curve. Um, it is very annoying to deal with the compiler, especially when you're starting out. But the goal of these lectures, homeworks, and MPs is to get you a good understanding of what each error message means, how to fix them. So when you begin working on your own final projects, you'll have a much better understanding of why Rust works the way it does. And hopefully by then it no longer makes you furious. But I ask that you please hang in there. Um, it is a difficult language to learn, especially as uh, you know, uh, learning CS for the first time or learning C++ for the first time. Um, it is a very difficult language to learn. OK, so brief review of ownership. I'm going to fly through these because uh, we've already been through them in past lectures. So. Three rules, each value in Rust has a variable called its owner, and there can only be one owner at a time. And so we get this is where we get the borrowing rules from. Um, because there can only be one owner at a time, we want a way for other variables, other functions to access that data. So that's borrowing. And so when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. So any reference we have to that data um, will be invalid because the data no longer exists. Um, it's no longer valid, so our reference is no longer valid. And we have this notion of scope. Uh, when w goes out of scope, this data is dropped. Um, and this sort of touches on the point that there's only one owner at a time. Okay. And then the reference rules. So 
Uh, the ampersand represents a reference. We'll talk more about this. Um, so references allow you to uh, refer to some value for some piece of data without taking ownership of it. So you have your owner, that's a separate thing, and you have your reference, which also has access to the data, so you can read it um, without taking ownership. And at any given time, you can have either one mutable reference or an infinite number of immutable references. Um, so here, we are not allowed to have two mutable references. Uh, calling functions implicitly creates a second mutable reference to our variable x, and we already have y being that first mutable reference to x. Okay. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is sort of how your code fits into your RAM, your program memory, and how memory interacts with your code. So uh, you'll see this diagram a lot, especially in data structures, especially in computer architecture, maybe even in operating systems. Um, this is what your code sees when it sort of boots up and tries to access memory. So you have the stack. So any variables you create, um, they'll most likely be stored on the stack. Uh, any uh, sort of objects or data structures or anything like that will most likely have their internal data stored on the heap. So if you have a vector, your vector will probably have all of the elements you add to it somewhere in this heap section. Um, but any integers you have that are sort of stored in a variable like x or y, they will most likely be stored on the stack. Um, the stack is quick, and so for integers, you know, you can just quickly look at the stack, copy it over if you need to. But rather, for vectors, when you want to clone something, it takes a long trek to the heap to look at all of your elements in your vector, potentially millions, um, which is why we have this cloning operation, which is expensive. And then you have these three sections down here. So this text section is where your assembly code and compiled code goes. So when you say cargo build, um, Rust, C, and Cargo create this executable for you. They create this machine code file for you. If you've ever tried and opened up an executable, you'll see that VS Code or whatever text editor you're using isn't able to read it. You just see a bunch of garbage. That garbage is interpreted by your computer. It's interpreted by your hardware. Um, and here is where all of that assembly code goes and where all of those constant uh, constants in your code go. And so in a future slide, we're going to be taking apart a basic Rust program and showing you what this text section looks like. Um, and then you have these other two sections. Uh, they are for global variables. So uninitialized global variables, initialized global variables, um, they go here. And then this section up here, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I believe environment variables go up here, or environment variables and program arguments um, go up here. So uh, we'll be talking about some stack data, heap data, and the text section in this video. Okay, so um, we mentioned in a previous lecture that the string type has ownership over its characters. A string under the hood is um, pretty much an array of characters, maybe some length, maybe some capacity. Um, at the end of the day, it has ownership of some array of characters. And so if we wanted to get a substring, we would like a couple things. So some type of reference to a portion of the original string because uh, we don't want to duplicate the string data. Um, and so we want to sort of get a peek into what the string looks like, peek, a peek into its internal array of characters. Uh, but we don't want to copy it. Okay. And then we also want the original string to keep ownership of its characters. We don't want the substring to take ownership um, so we're no longer able to use the string. That um, is a wasteful operation. So uh, we have this string S1 and you know, it contains the characters H, E, L, L, O, and we want, say, a portion of it. Okay, well, let me hide my camera here. So under the hood, we might have uh, S, have ownership of this array uh, with, you know, five elements. Each uh, element has a, or e each spot in the array has a character in it. And um, our string looks like this. We have a pointer to some array and the length as a variable and the capacity as a variable. Um, you'll learn more about this, why we need this capacity in say a data structures class, um, but we can say a basic string would have this field. 
And we want this original string, this original variable S1 to keep ownership of this array, but we want a separate variable to have a reference to a substring, say LL. Okay. So this is where string slices come in. So um, we have this notion of borrowing the string and borrowing a portion of the data of that string. So the string type keeps ownership of its characters um, and we can take a slice to get a substring of the original string's characters. So a string slice is a reference to just a portion of the string and the reference can be either um, some subsection, some substring of the string, or the entire string. It's simply just a reference. And we have this notion that the original string has, still has ownership of the characters. Um, we can still use S beyond these references. These references are immutable references to the original data. So we can pass on ownership, um, we can you know, move ownership, we can drop it, and then the references become invalid. So I want to point out this um, range notation. So you might be familiar with this from for loops. Uh, we have the start, which is inclusive, two dots, and then the end, which is exclusive. And then, so you denote a string slice with an ampersand in front, and then this bracket notation to define how far you want your string slice to go. Um, and so you can drop the front value, uh, it's implicitly zero. You can drop the end value, it's implicitly the uh, final character of your string. So from some start to the end. And if you have the dot dot notation with no start, no end, that is equivalent to the, a borrow of the entire string, a substring that is the entire string. It's equivalent to just taking a reference. Um, the type is different though, it's subtly different. If you have this ampersand and then S and brackets, you get an ampersand str. If you just take an ampersand without the brackets, you'll have a reference to a string. So ampersand string. Slightly different, but um, functionally the same. Okay, so uh, to create string slices, like we said, you use a reference, you use an ampersand to take a reference, and you specify a range in brackets. So you use the start dot dot stop notation, starts inclusive, the stop is exclusive. Um, you can drop the start to imply index zero, drop the end to imply the end of your slice or your string, and um, no stop or start simply indicates index zero to the end of the string. This is equivalent to a normal borrow, again, it's just that the type you get out of it is different. Um, this notation gives you an ampersand str. If you just have a borrow with no range, it's an ampersand string. So be careful, there might be some edge cases where this matters, but usually it should not. Okay. And like I said, slices are read only. They're immutable. We are not using a mutable borrow. You cannot use an immutable borrow to take slices. And we'll talk about why. Well, in the meantime, why do you think that is? So, um, we have a couple slices here. And let's say we try to make them mutable. Let's say we try to make hello a mutable slice and world a mutable slice. Okay. And then, um, suppose we tried to make hello world a mutable slice as well. So we see here that we have two overlapping regions. Hello uh, covers this first part of the string. Hello world also covers the first part of the string. So we have two mutable borrows to the same part of the string, which introduces what's known as a race condition. We have multiple things racing to modify the data. So we have no sort of guarantee as to which variable gets to modify the data. So to solve this problem, we just say slices are read-only, they cannot change the original data, um, only a mutable reference to all of the data can change it, or the actual owner can change it. Okay. So um, let's take a look at what string slices are under the hood. Uh, string slices are you might hear another word for them, you might hear fat pointers. Fat pointers are simply a pointer to, to some location in memory, and the length of how far that pointer goes um, past the start. So uh, we have this string, it's hello world, it, um, we have this string that points to an array of characters, 
and we have some information about the length and the capacity. And then we try to take this string slice world. So um, world starts at index 6 and goes on to index 11 exclusive, so 6 to 10. And um, we know that the length is 5. We want starting at 6 and going down 5 characters. So uh, in essence, this string slice is a fat pointer. It points to some location in memory, uh, points to some original data that S owns, and specifies how far we want to go with it. Okay, and so um, I want to point out that this is different than um, simply just saying, you know, an ampersand str. So uh, we know world here is type ampersand str. It is a reference to some str data, some string data. The difference is we created this on the heap. Um, we said earlier that the strings may store their characters on the heap because they're sort of initialized uh, when the program is running. So uh, this fat pointer points to somewhere on the heap. So the original world points to somewhere here. But when we have a string literal, so when you simply just say in quotes some text, that is known as a string literal. That is baked into your program. When you compile it, your, compiler, your, your computer needs to know that you want this string sometime in your program so I'm going to put it literally into the program, and we'll show you what this looks like in the actual assembly code in a second. So we have this world string in this example, um, in, in this like text section of the data. And um, if this was a global variable, we'd have this pointer up in here, and this pointer pointed to your text section, uh, where this world is actually located. So when you see an ampersand str, think, is it a pointer to some text section? Is it already initialized? Or is it a string slice and a pointer to some heap data? Um, so slight distinction, but when you have string literals like this, when you have an ampersand str, uh, think about whether it's on the heap or whether it's you know in this text section. OK. So we said uh, earlier when we have this string s, hello world, this uh, the, the characters are in the heap. This array is somewhere in the heap, and we have this variable s. s has these three fields. It's a struct, probably located on the stack, and this stack has this pointer, and pointer points to this location in the heap. Okay, And then when we have this variable world, world points to some place in this array. It points to, again, somewhere in the heap. So. Um, when you have a string slice, it is most likely a pointer to some location in the heap, uh, especially if it is a string slice of uh, amp, uh, capital S string. If you have a string literal, uh, simply something with quotes in it, uh, quotes and some characters, that is a pointer to your text section. It is already initialized, it is already in your code. Okay, so. Um, let's find a string in program memory. So I mentioned briefly, uh, when you you know when you have this executable, when you compile your code, uh, you get this machine readable file, and that file is loaded into this text section when your program starts. So we're going to try to find a string in this text section. Okay. So I have this basic uh, program here. I declare a variable, some random string literal located in the text section, and I have a print hello world function call. So I've already compiled this code. Um, I have basically taken the unreadable um, program code and used this tool object dump to convert it to a human readable uh, file format. So you'll notice these hex characters. Um, these are all sort of instructions, pieces of data that your, comp that your computer will read when it starts up your program. Um, so usually these are encoded directly in hex characters, not in these um, human readable hex characters. So uh, object dump makes it easy yet for us to read it. Okay. So I mentioned earlier, when we have this ampersand str, this string literal, it is going to be in our code. So this is the program dump. So I can simply just look for the string, and it will be in the code we load into the text section. So some random, here we go. So contents of the text section, 
this constant data, um, we have some random string literal, and immediately after this string ends, we have hello world. So how does Rust know where the string starts, where it ends? Um, that is where the notion of fat pointers comes in. We have this string, and it has both a pointer to wherever this is in memory, and it has the length. Uh, however long this string is, this variable knows I'm looking to some pointer, some pointer to memory, and some length of characters, and stop after a particular length. That is how Rust knows that, okay, this hello world is not part of ABC, it is part of the thing you want to print. So again, hello world is a string literal, um, it is also located in our uh, text section of the program. And then you'll notice that there's a bunch of other uh, sort of strings that the Rust standard library uses. Um, most of it's gibberish. I'm assuming that um, this section up here is some type of error. Um, you don't need to worry too much about that. Okay. So we found our string literal in the text section, um, and we know that this uh, ABC is a stack variable that is a pointer, a fat pointer, to our text section that has a pointer to this data, pointer to that memory, and also the length of how far that pointer should go. Okay. Um, we are running low on time, so I'm going to skip over the slices example. It is basically just showing how you can take slices of different strings. Um, go back in this video to the slides. It is the exact same code as uh, the code on that slide. I simply just run it. Okay, just like we can take string slices, we can take slices of vectors. We can take a subvector of a larger vector. They're constructed the exact same way as a string slice. You borrow the original vector and you specify a range with the start stop notation. Um, and again, slices are read only, they are immutable. You cannot change the original vector from a string slice. You must either use a mutable reference to the entire vector, or you must be the owner and modify the vector directly. Um, vector slices have type a um, array slice. Uh, this bracket notation is an array, the ampersand is a borrow, and this t is whatever is inside your vector. So if you have a vector of i32s, the vector slice will have type ampersand bracket i32. Um, So vector has elements of type T, any generic type. We'll be talking about why we use this type T here in two lectures, I believe. Um, and it's simply just a borrow to a, an array. Vectors under the hood are just arrays, the same way that strings are arrays of characters. Vectors are arrays of some other element of type T. Okay. Um, we can do a brief example of vector slices. Let's get into that. Okay, so I have my vector here, um, 1, 2, 8, 1, 9, 9. Uh, this is an array of i32s, probably located in the heap. Um, whenever my program starts, I will allocate some data on the heap and put these values in there. Okay, and then I can take a slice of it. Um, again, I use the ampersand and then the bracket dot dot notation. Uh, and so I get a borrow to an array borrow to this internal vector. It's a fat pointer again. It is saying it's some location in memory and it's three elements long. And then I can print that out. Um, and then again, I can sort of iterate over a slice, iterate over two to five. And then also um, I can take, uh, you know, multiple consecutive slices of a vector. So we start out by printing one, two, eight. That's the first three elements. Then we print out elements two to five exclusive. So um, what is that? Eight, one, nine, that's index two, that's index three, index four, and skip over index five. That's what this is saying. And then we're taking just consecutive slices. So start at zero, then um, go three elements past. So start at index zero, one, two, eight, then shift over, go to two, eight, one, then shift over again, 819, and finally 199. That's all that this loop is saying. So 
Um, you can take slices, similar to the way you can take string slices, uh, same syntax. All right. That is all for today, folks. Thank you for hanging in there. This lecture was a long one, but hopefully gives you a good look ahead into what you'll cover in your data structures and your architecture classes. Um, yeah, hopefully this makes sense about why you need the interpersonal STR type, why you need borrows, um, and what fat pointers are if you ever run into those in the future. But yeah, take care.